Race, Gender, and Sexuality course with Toni Morrison's short story, Recitative. Students are often confused. They know Morrison as a novelist. I explain that Morrison, like many, are not single beings, but traverse spectrums of thought and embody many gifts. Recitative grounds our coursework as it brings race, gender, sexuality, and class into contesting conversations. Using this text, I am able to guide students to challenge their conventions despite their varying social and political locations when they arrive in the classroom, and to question their perceptions about race and its intersecting modes of power. So we spend our beginning days with this text, outlining and drawing diagrams to try to figure out how we might locate race in the story. The students assess the gender dynamics, they assess the class dynamics, they assess the age dynamics, and other factors like disability in the story. From there, I prompt them to take a leap of faith. I ask them to racially identify the two central characters in the story, Twyla and Roberta, because Morrison refuses that gesture. The students freeze. Despite their tireless efforts to flesh out the individual qualities of each character and their story, the students refuse to speak. No one wants to be wrong, and no one wants to make an outright racial assumption. I assure them this exercise is without penalty or consequence. Then some begin to hesitatingly speak. Some think Twyla is black, some think Roberta is white. But regardless of what they assume, what we are able to uncover in this exercise is that there are a lot of arbitrary signifiers that are leading us to these conclusions. And in fact, those arbitrary signifiers can cross the racial structural positions of black and white interchangeably. This is not to suggest racial whiteness and blackness are arbitrary, but it is because our common sense assumptions about what constitutes these categories is opaque and mutable. The collective unconscious surrounding race is impaired at the level of memory and imagination. However, Morrison hides in the story the structures that lack opacity and mutability, and in those factors are the determinants of racial division and stratification. So when we pull back from the story and stop assessing the behavioral, affective, and emotive qualities of the characters, what we are able to find is the evidence of racial categorization is very present and the structural organization of life that exceeds and anticipates each character's arrival and departure. What this illuminating structure is, is history. Morrison uses the political and social histories of race that bred space and place to align characters with racialized conditions that are historically immutable. And they are immutable because these histories happened and their occurrences cannot be erased, although in many ways have been silenced by our collective unconscious refusals to retell and remember and imagine the inner workings of history. So in the end, the point of the exercise is less about the characters' identities, albeit those are important. However, I find across the many works that Morrison has offered us, from novels to short stories and essays, which I will speak more about here today, that we are able to disentangle our assumptive logics of what makes and unmakes the world that stands before us. In a 1995 essay, The Sight of Memory, Morrison toils understandings of the American slave narrative. As a scholar working on critical histories of slavery, this is a piece I often return to, and the essay I will spend the remainder of my time today discussing. Though the range of autobiographies engaged in the site of memory are broad, from Alato Equiano to Harriet Jacobs, Frederick Douglass, Henry Bibb, and more, Morrison finds that a shadow is cast over each autobiography by the structural conditions of their productions and publications. Although accounts like Equiano's quote gave fuel to the fire that abolitionist, abolitionists were setting everywhere, she writes, quote, popular taste discouraged the writers from dwelling too long and too carefully on the more sordid details of their experience, end quote. Thus, the descriptive texture of slavery's violence, both spectacular and quotidian, are brushed away with silence. The Sight of Memory quotes Henry Box Brown's autobiography in stating, quote, I am not about to harrow the feelings of my readers by a, ter by a terrific representation of the untold horrors of that fearful system of oppression, 
It is not my purpose to descend deeply into the dark and noisome caverns of the hell of slavery." End quote. One can ascertain that under these conditions of not arousing the disdain of white sympathetic readers, that much of the inner contours of slavery remain unseen. Yet modern racial slavery is positioned in most social and political thought as a categorizable set of violences that are both recognizable and containable. This appears in definitive statements that assert what slavery was and how we can find evidence to prove the facticity of such. Thus, the premier authority on slavery is placed upon the slave narrative to speak truth to the form and function of the peculiar institution, as there is a perception that telling and retelling the story chips away at the structure. As such, theories of slavery continuously grapple with a limited selection of first-hand accounts to make sense of its most obscene and violent iterations, which as previously stated, these texts understandably are limited in their discussion of such, given the historical conditions under which they were written and the vexed nature of their production with respect to the publishers and assumed audiences. This is by no means an indictment of these writers, but one of the world which they, as former slaves, were positioned to write into. The limitations placed upon these narratives are structurally positioned and upheld by maintaining ancillary focus on the candid yet censored voices of the former slaves. These voices, which Morrison notes, quote, over and over, pull the narrative up short with phrases such as, but let us drop the veil over these proceedings too terrible to relate, end quote. Respectfully, slave narratives and other first-hand accounts of slavery are critically important for materials for theorizing the aphasias that meet the brutality of slavery. However, these narrative accounts must be held in conversation with theories of the larger paradigm of slavery that condition the possibilities of their emergences, reception, and also the replication of these brutalities they do and do not reveal are wagered in the present tense as to immure us to the pain by virtue of their familiarity. The duality of exposure and secrecy presented by these counts is most silent around an elaboration of many things, but sexual violence is the most pivotal and often veiled silence. In incidents in the life of a slave girl, Harriet Jacob illumines this silence not as a choice taken on by black people, but one violently imposed by whites where she writes, quote, the secrets of slavery are concealed like those of the Inquisition. My master was, to my knowledge, the father of eleven slaves. But did the mother dare to tell who the father of their children? Did the other slaves dare to allude to it except in whispers amongst themselves? No, indeed. They knew too well the terrible consequences." End quote. What Jacobs reveals is the effects nature of silence given that the taboo here is not preconditioned by a religious or moral sentiment adverse to exposing the interracial sexual encounter but one produced by the racially antagonistic drive of whites to maintain access to and power over black sexuality without remark. The relation between gratuitous sexual availability produced by violent means and the lack of remarkability of such a condition prefigures the complications for thought and action that pervade present engagements with the peculiar institution. Morrison highlights Linda Marie Child's its introduction to Jacob's autobiography as evidence of the particularly vexed feelings about exposing the sexual proclivities of slavery. Child writes, quote, I am well aware that many will accuse me of indecorum for presenting these pages to the public. Going further to and reinforce that Jacob's is intelligent despite these exposures, stating further, quote, this peculiar phase of slavery has generally been kept veiled, but the public ought to be made acquainted with its monstrous features." End quote. Despite the honesty Jacobs puts forth here, little is revealed, as Morrison notes, about the interior life of slaves that is less interested in appeasing or informing an outside subject. What I find fascinating about Morrison's pause on sexual violence in the comments provided by Child is the timeless feature of slavery's aphasic relationship to sexual violence. This particular silence around sex and slavery is where my research rests. As a scholar, I am invested in uncovering the long durée of the veil drawn over the perverse nature of this institution, 
while Morrison highlights the repeated raisings of the veil in 18th and 19th century text, most namely autobiography, in my own research I have found that the veil of silence continues to pervade conversations about the sexual terrors of slavery. Take as example this 2019 Washington Post article entitled, Two Centuries Ago, University of Virginia Students Beat and Raped Enslaved Servants, Historians Say, end quote highlighting two recently published books, Thomas Jefferson's Education by Alan Taylor and Educated in Tyranny, Slavery at Thomas Jefferson's University by Maury D. McInnes. The article intends to weave together a scandalous narrative about the interwoven nature of a respected institution of higher education, slavery, and the sexual abuse of slaves. However, the first sentence of the article exposes its fissure. It states, quote, the two young white university students had a secret, end quote, revealing the subjects of the stories are not the slaves who were sexually abused. The morality of white students and the larger institution are what the spectacle presumes to unearth. Although sexual subjection, slavery, and Thomas Jefferson are no shock to anyone familiar with the vexed nature and history of Sally Hemings and the Hemings family. The following scene is the only dedicated account of sexual abuse provided in the article. Quote, it was September 1826 and the men, both scions of wealthy southern slaveholding families, were suffering from the same sexually transmitted disease. Conferring, they identified a possible culprit, an enslaved black woman whom both had raped. They also thought of a solution. Joined by several classmates, Turner Dixon and George Hoffman attacked the woman, accusing her of giving them a venereal disease, stripped her naked, and beat her. Her name is lost, but her age is known, 16. The 16-year-old slave girl, who is inappropriately referred to as a woman here, is left bare by the acts that produced her sexual subjection, and I argue by the retelling of this story. Her rape, exposure to an STI, and merciless beating fade into the backdrop. An expose into the lives of two wealthy students unfold thereafter, leading into a discussion of the sinister foundations of UVA and its relationship to Thomas Jefferson. I would suggest that although the name of the 16-year-old is lost, she is not lost. Sexual violations like the one she was made to endure play a particular role in the psychosexual afterlife of slavery. The maneuvering of these violent sexual acts demonstrates a profound reliance on the reanimation of the sexual violation of the slave. Telling the story is assumed to perform a type of care work as an antidote to the violence by presuming that mere reference of the violated is redemptive. Paraphrasing UVA professor Alan Thomas, the Washington Post article states, quote, while shocking today, the incidents were unremarkable for its time, end quote. However, it seems given the handling of the story that something continues to be unremarkable about the sexual violations of slavery. Is the problem of telling the story of the 16-year-old sexually violated girl a problem of history? Does omission in the archive occlude deeper understandings Or is the relationship between the sexual violation of the slave a continuum that is continued to call, I'm sorry, or is the relationship between the sexual violation of the slave a continuum that is called upon to perform a particular type of subject making and fact telling? How does the spectacle allow the casualness of this occlusion to repeat itself without end? How is the sexually vulnerable slave still made available? I would submit that the sexually violated nature of slavery includes the unchartable sexually violating acts and conditions that are present and absent in the historical archive of slavery and the fantasy of slave sexual vulnerability. The misrepresentation of sexual violence in the archive, both in primary and secondary text, as well as the underscoring of violations as strikingly material are central concern here. What is the time of the violation? When is the time of slavery? Is it prior to, during, or post the act? Is it the fantasy of the act's possibility, the material effects of the act's occurrence, or in the terror of remembering? Returning to Morrison's remarks in the sight of memory, she offers strategies for moving the veil aside. 
Much like my discussion of recitative with my students, there is a way to tell the interior stories of sexual violence and slavery without ca caving to moral or affective tones and gestures or assuming that nothing can be known beyond the violent act. Understanding that slavery is a collective story Morrison offers, that in, in addition to our own knowing, the writer can also, quote, depend on the recollection of others, end quote. This is where memory enters the frame. Though resting on memory and recollection alone, she cautions is not enough, as Morrison makes clear that, quote, only the act of imagination can help me here, end quote. This opens the ability she contends to, quote, explore two worlds in the the actual and the possible, because the act of imagination is bound up with memory." End quote. We must remember, with the fragmented archival rem remnants, what existed, how it existed, and under what conditions did it produce the coherence of what stands before and in front of us. It is the expansive nature of how we remember that locates the specifics of the path or paths forward. What is redress for the sexually vulnerable slave? Some may argue that the formal end of the institution is that. However, the dedication Morrison offers to beloved, 60 million and more, summons the intractability of loss set forth by the Middle Passage and its innumerable refractions. Holding the magnitude of this reorganization of the world must stay present in memory and imagination and serve as a starting point to contest conjectures that apply that any I'm sorry that imply that any aspect of slavery in its afterlife is benign additionally as morrison makes clear in the sight of memory quote all water has perfect memory and is forever trying to get back to where it was and thus quote still like water i remain where i was before i was straightened out End quote thank you <laughs>